Hi everyone, I'm Justin Schreiber and I'm Vice President of Marketing here at LinkedIn. I am really excited to be hosting today's Live with Thought Leaders. I'm joined by Mary Shea. We're going to have a minute to t chat a little bit why Mary is so special. But before we do, I've been uh, asked to take care of a few housekeeping items. So first of all, if you have any questions at all, feel free to submit those via the webinar console. And secondly, after the show, you'll have the opportunity to take a survey. Please fill it out. It's very helpful to us as we think about future shows. And now, without further ado, I'm joined today by Mary Shea. Now, Mary has been working with LinkedIn for some time. We're so excited to have her on the show. She was with us about a year ago now at our Sales and Marketing Connect event. We always, we always score the speakers, and Mary was off the charts in terms of the insights and the perspective that she brought. And one of the things that I love, Mary, about your background is that you really bring a combination of thought leadership, but also pragmatic insights into the trade. I think that's because of the fact that you've founded businesses, you've run businesses, uh, adjunct professor for a while at, at Booth School of Business yeah. in Chicago, um, and obviously now at Forrester. So thank you so much for joining us today. It's going to be a great conversation. Well, thanks for having me, Justin. I'm thrilled to be here and um, really excited and passionate about the topic. So um, let's have it. All right. Before we get into the meat of the discussion, okay. we need to get to know you a little bit better. Okay. We're going to do speed round. These these questions Mary has never seen before. No. Justin so would not reveal them. I would not reveal them. Uh, she tried <laughs> hard tried. to get them I out did. of me. I did. I have them on my iPad here. So we're just going to run All through right, let's these. Do it. Lickety split. Number one, last foreign city you visited? Last foreign city I visited, I believe, was Dubai. Dubai, all right. Favorite Ben and Jerry ice cream flavor? Oh, well. So many to choose from. I only eat cho chocolate chip. So chocolate I'm chip. a traditionalist. Okay. So that's it. New York super fudge chunk may or may not qualify. That's mine, though. Okay. Just, good. just to all go right. on record. Good to know. All right. Favorite, this is, this is going to be a complicated one. Favorite day of the week? Favorite, that is really hard. Everybody has a different favorite day. Yeah. You know, I kind of think Thursday's my favorite. Thursday. Yeah. Okay. Kind of grooving into the weekend, still got a little bit more to do. I love my job, so that's always fun, but weekends are great too. I, I love the fact that it's Thursday and not the weekend. That says a lot about, about the environment at Forrester. So yeah. good sign I up. love. I love it. All right. What are you currently reading? I'm currently reading a book called Sapiens, nonfiction, yes. and it's pretty heavy, um, but it really looks at um, humans in the world and kind of why we are where we are today. So I haven't finished it, but it's a really great book. It's a great book. I will, uh, I will definitely endorse that one as cool. well. Whether you agree or disagree with the perspective, very provocative. And it sure is. Kind of one of those books that is a sweeping survey of our civilization and society and, and where we came from. Absolutely. Okay. If I were to pull, are you an iPhone user? Yes, or, I am. Okay. If I were to pull up your iPhone on your go-to playlist, <laughs> what are the top three songs I would hear? Oh my gosh. Um, I don't think I have a playlist. On my you iPhone. Just, you just experience the music experience as it comes to you. I experience it as it comes to me. So I'll use uh, Pandora or Spotify and I'll sort of pick whatever I want at the moment. So um, I tend to like listen to a song over and over and over again until I can. So you wear it out. Yeah, I kind of do. Yeah. yeah. So Purple Rain is my all time favorite. Oh. Um, but right now I'm listening to everything Elton John because I just saw the movie. Yeah. So. All right. All right, plus one on Elton as well. Okay. And, and lastly, and this is where we really wanted to get into the psychology of Mary Shea. <laughs> okay. So if you go back to when you were a kid, what cartoon character did you relate most to? I never watched cartoons. Whoa, all right. This explains why Mary is where she is and why I am where I am today. My parents had a limited amount of PBS that we were allowed to watch, and that was it. Okay. So um, I never watched cartoons. Mary, we have so much that we could talk about today. Mary is also a professional oboist. Is that the right term? That is oboist? the right term. Yeah. So, so along her journey to becoming the principal analyst at Forrester, she just happened to dabble in the oboe and, and became a professional musician playing orchestras and whatnot, probably because you didn't watch cartoons. Probably. Okay. <laughs> All right. Now that we have that out of the way, I think, I think we, we have a better sense. Flow? I think we have a better sense for what's okay. going on here. So let's dive into the topic du jour. It is sales enablement. Yes. Uh, I've had the opportunity in my career 
to be both on the marketing side of the house and the sales side of the house. Right. Sales enablement is so important because I can't tell you how many times, either as a marketer or as a sales professional, uh, you build these grandiose plans. Right. And you've got them dialed in, and then you forget one important thing. The salespeople actually have to execute, execute. on them. Yeah. And so if you've overlooked the sales enablement component, you've really, you've really kind of missed the boat on everything. So um, let's start there. From your perspective, and I know you've done a lot of research on this, why is sales enablement so important? Yeah, yeah. So great, great preamble there, and I agree with everything that you said. I think we're at an interesting point in time right now where sales enablement is not a new discipline. It's not a new function. It's been around for about 20 years but it's experiencing an incredible renaissance. And it's more important than ever before because of buyers and the changing dynamics that are happening with buyers and how they want to interact with marketing assets and with sellers. And so um, I think it's absolutely mission critical that organizations that want to um, deliver a world-class buyer experience and put their sellers on equal footing with buyers to really have a program in place, and not only to have a program, but to modernize it. So, yeah, I like uh, I like the point you make about buyers. Buyers are changing everything. Yes, um, I think that uh, the amount of of power of influence that buyers have in the whole process has caused us not only to rethink sales enablement, but more generally the sales processes that we're putting together. Completely and. Along those lines, I'm even starting to think that we shouldn't call it a sales process. We should we should really call it a buying process, right? But um, your point is well taken, which is the buyer has changed so much in the last three to five years that organizations that go to market the same way they have um, will not survive or thrive. They'll get disintermediated, and not just disintermediated by um, a competitor, but disintermediated by the buyer themselves. So if you think about today's business buyers, they have so many different options where mm -hmm. they can acquire information about a new firm mm -hmm. or a solution or product that they want to add to the portfolio. And they're self-directed, they're digitally savvy, um, and they're pretty sophisticated. And all of this has happened because of their interactions with their favorite personal brands. What, what, are, what are some of your favorite personal brands? I'm an outdoor guy, so I like Patagonia. Yeah, I love that um, too. You know, entertainment is, uh, I, I think Netflix and what they're doing is phenomenal and the way they Incredible. personalize content, the right. way that they've kind of integrated across the stack. And not only do they know what I want, but they're able to create it. Right, so personalization is really mm -hmm. key for you. Yeah. So if you think about business buyers, they have really been molded and shaped, their expectations have in terms of how they want to act, interact in a business setting. So they expect to have an Amazon, Apple, mm -hmm. or Spotify-like, or Netflix-like experience mm -hmm. now in a business context. And it's really difficult to do that at scale. Yeah. Um, and so as a result of those expectations, sales enablement as a discipline of function is becoming mission critical to organizations. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and, and it's interesting, the bar has definitely been raised in terms of the, the quality of service that we're able to enjoy, particularly on the consumer side. Right. I don't think we necessarily appreciate how good some of these, yeah. these companies are, but what we certainly see is the contrast. Right. So as the bar goes up, we don't appreciate how the bar is rising, but if there's someone that isn't meeting that bar, we certainly see the contrast down there. And in my experience, um, B2C is really at this point kind of pioneering I agree. That, that personalized experience. Yeah. And it's the B2B organizations now that are, are trying to catch up to it. Yeah, absolutely. And so some of the best organizations are working very, very quickly to catch up. And I think what's really exciting is that there's so many new technologies out there and mm -hmm. new tools, particularly in the MarTech and sales tech space, right? Mm -hmm. And these tools now are getting much more mature and really starting to deliver on the promise that we had hoped, you know, a few years ago. And so, you know, with smart tooling, along with sales enablement, having the right strategies in place, um, companies can begin to deliver that consumer-like experience in a B2B world. Yeah. So, uh, so let's focus then on sales enablement specifically. Actually, we're using that term. What is sales enablement? Yeah. How do you define it? Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll start by defining how, how it has been defined you know, over the past 20 years or so. And it's mm -hmm. really had been about providing sellers with the right content to deliver 
as part of the sales process at the right point in time. So very much focused, I think, in the past on content training. But as we go into the 21st century, deeper into the 21st century, and think about it as a modern discipline, it's really about really helping sellers and putting sellers in all of your selling systems, because typically sales enablement has only focused on the direct sales force. But I think in time, it's going to focus on the indirect channels and mm -hmm. potentially even e-commerce and digital. Um, it's really about creating greater effectiveness, efficiencies, and better experiences. Yeah. Um, and by better experiences for the buyer, but also better experiences for the seller mm -hmm. and the marketer. Think of all the sellers that spend you know, all this time searching for content in 10 different portals and they can't get it and eventually they just create it on their own. Well, that's not good because it's not brand consistent. And think about marketers who can't get feedback from sellers on what content's resonating. And so um, I think really creating this better experience for the constituents mm. that matter is really key. I love, I love that word experience. It resonates because I just was at uh, a presentation and an executive from Airbnb spoke. Yeah. And they talked about the migration that Air Airbnb has been on. Obviously, initially, it was all about getting you in a great place as yeah. you were uh, visiting or doing business or whatever. And the insight that this person shared was, at the end of the day, people don't necessarily want a place to stay. They actually want to create an experience. Totally agree. And the place to stay is part of that experience. Right. But... You know, the experience is, is, is the ultimate objective. And they're doing some really fascinating things now, uh, working with people in Italy where you can yeah. go and you can make pasta with people right. that actually make pasta and, and, and helping to create these moments or these events. Yeah. Again, B2C, but what you're saying it resonates with me so much because whereas before sales enablement was all about what's the asset you need to use. Correct. Now it's about how do you create a way to, to build an ideal experience for the buyer. And that's partly assets, but it's so much more than it's that. It's so much more than that. And the experience is really this personalization that we're mm -hmm. talking about, things that matter to me, mm -hmm. um, and filtering out all the noise. And I agree with you on the B2C conversation. You know, I always hear this stated, you know, you, you go to Starbucks not necessarily to get the coffee, but to talk to the barista, to yeah. have a connection. Yeah. And so having those interactions that are meaningful, valuable, that relate to who you are as a person and your company. Yeah. Um, those are the things that I think are increasingly important. I think the other thing that is really new about sales enablement is that um, you know, with these programs that uh, you can put in place and with smart tooling and the right strategies and process and, and execution, you can really start to drive the needle on um, top line and margin growth. Mm -hmm. And so with that, along with the customer experience, you're going to see sales enablement take a much more visible role yeah. in organizations. So it's not just that we're we're doing this to do it. It actually drops real dollars to the bottom line it's if you do it right. It's really, really drop real bottles, dollars okay. to the bottom line. Exactly. Um, so as a, as a buyer, I love this conversation. It's all about me. Mm -hmm. um, it's all about creating the experience that I want to have. As a sales executive, I'm petrified of this <laughs> this discussion Why? because, well, because um, I have to give up control. Yeah, you know, I think about whether I'm from a small company and I'm just trying to form the sales organization, or I'm from a massive company, right? And I'm trying to come up with a, a consistent approach. This, to me, sounds like it could turn into the wild west in terms of every buyer's different. That means every sales. Ex how do you how do you wrangle that? How do you get your arms around that? Yeah, so I mean, I've done a lot of research that really looks at the seller and how that discipline's changing, and the world is mm -hmm. changing. Um, and I've done a lot that really looks at, you know, what, it, what is it going to take to be a successful seller in this world? Um, and there's a couple things. It's, you know, you, you've got to have uh, digital savvy. Mm -hmm. You've got to be active on a variety of different social networks. You've got to be able to deliver insights got to partner with marketing. You've got to be more collaborative. You know, the days of the lone wolf are over for mm -hmm, sellers. Mm -hmm. So it can be a scary time, but I think at the same time, sellers that embrace this journey um, are going to make more money than they've ever made before. They're going to be more successful. And even more important to that for sellers, I think, is that they're going to have a much more more profound impact on their customer's business and their customer success. People always think sales people are motivated by money. Sure, that's part of it. But I would say that salespeople tend to be more motivated by seeing their customers be really, really successful. 
oftentimes also by being innovators in their own organizations mm -hmm. and leading the charge with new technologies or new methods. So um, it's a different world, and salespeople are going to have to embrace some of these new tools, yeah. and they're going to have to be a lot more collaborative in working with marketers. Yep, yep. Yeah, going back to what's driving a sales professional, I agree with you that there is a satisfaction that comes when you see the buyer cross the finish line, whatever yeah. that finish line is, yeah. and know that you were a part of that. That, yes. that makes a big difference. It sure does. We, we just ran a, a global survey, and we talked about all things buying and selling, what's important, what's not important. What was fascinating about the survey, we first asked the buyer what they cared about, and then we asked the salesperson what they cared about. Both sides came back and said trust is paramount. Yeah, and it it, it makes sense from a buying perspective um, that they would want to yeah. to trust. But to hear the salespeople say, "I get that," and and now I'm focusing <clears throat> on that was great. Yeah. And the other thing that was really fascinating is that buyers actually put trust even above price. Yes, it's not about can I get the best price. It's about can I really trust this person? It really isn't. Yeah. It's funny, you know, we talked a lot about B2C, but a B2B purchase is actually really emotional as well. Mm -hmm. In many cases, the impact can be much more deeply felt by the buyer, whether the initiative is so successful that they get promoted, they get accolades, they're a leader within the organization, or if the initiative falls flat and they actually get fired. I mean, those things happen. And so buyers are scared. Yeah. And having trust and being able to have an empathetic connection with their seller, I 100% agree is more important than price yep. in many cases. So I'm going to take a little bit of a detour here. Okay. Um, you, uh, way back in your career, actually sold cars. I did. We, we were talking about this before. And came from a non-traditional background as a professional musician. Yes. You come on to the lot and uh, are, are going head to head with all these people that have made it a career. And yet I understand you were one of the top salespeople. I was. Um, in, in the dealership. Surely trust, um, rapport, all those things had to come come to, to the fore. What did you learn about selling in through that experience? Yeah, so I'll give a shout out to my, my first employer in the sales world was Herb Chambers Honda BMW, right? which is a big dealership in the Boston area for any <laughs> folks from New England will know that organization. And so I learned so much in such a short period of time, really about the diversity of people who are out there, uh -huh. what kind of different motivations drive purchase decisions, um, how to negotiate, how to work with others, how to size up a situation really quickly quickly, um, and how to be a closer, because you got to close the deal at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, and I was really successful, and maybe part of it was just luck and being at the right place in the right time or being the right gender or what have you. Um, but I think trust was a really big part um, of the component and, and part of my success, yeah. at least in that realm. And, and you were actually saying that at times you would give advice that didn't necessarily serve you as wanting to close a deal, but right. serve the, the buyer. Right. And that always seemed to work out in the end. It does. It comes back and, you know, you feel right having done the right thing. And I think it's really, you know, as you think about enterprise sales and ethical selling practices, at the end of the day, it feels great to know that you've helped the buyer make a decision that's right for them. Yeah. And that does come back, whether it's a, in, in the form of referrals or just a great feeling to know that you've helped someone make a great decision. Yeah. So going back to sales enablement, then there's this ethos, um, which is buyer first. Yes. There is a... Uh, there is a mindset of creating a personalized experience tailored to the buyer right. in order to put them first. And then there are the programs and the systems that sit underneath that that are going to be more of your standardized, codified approach. Right. What do those programs and those systems look like that allow you to get to those higher level goals? Yeah. So, um, you know, if you get a chance to read my report, uh, The Future of Sales Enablement is a C-suite, and I think it's going to be shared with the yeah, audience. We'll share that. Um, we really look at five key competencies that sales enablement leaders need to be involved in. So it's strategy, process, insights, tools, and technology. And so, um, you know, sales enablement leaders are going to have to insert themselves into all of those areas. And it's a pretty broad uh, portfolio. It's a broad purview. So from a strategy standpoint, I'm, I see sales enablement leaders really taking much more of a forward role in helping to architect and influence the overall commercial strategy for an organization and ensuring that strategy is mapped around the buyer. Right now, we did some research that shows that only about 9% of B2B organizations are creating their commercial strategy around the buyer. So there's mm -hmm. more work to be done mm -hmm. there. Um, in terms of process, 
uh, there's a great sales enablement leader uh, at, at Aptio who I did some research with, and he actually redesigned the sales process, rebranded it, and called it a buying process. Hmm. And then they went even deeper and changed the milestones that you used for the pipeline um, and changed those and rebranded those milestones so that they would reflect how the buyer would actually want to engage with marketing or sales if they were really interested in buying. Um, and it sounds like you know a small shift, but it was really a major mindset shift. So getting involved in those kinds of things, breaking down any kind of organizational silo that's going to prevent growth. Yeah. Sales enablement leaders are going to have to push into those areas. And mm -hmm. then I think, you know, as, as it relates to technology, um, they're going to be much more involved in uh, sourcing and acquiring and running evaluations around tools and technologies. Because in order to deliver this buyer-centric experience, you have to have the right tools. All of those tools need to be deeply integrated mm -hmm. so that you have 360 degree visibility of how the, how the customer's interacting with you. Um, and so the tool set is gonna be really important um, as well. And then, are, there, are there tools out there uh, that get you excited today yeah, that there's folks so many. might not have had access to five years yeah, ago? Yeah, there's, so there's so many tools that are popping up left and right. It makes it even hard for an analyst to keep up, um, but it's such an exciting time. So sales enablement automation. So tools um, that help sellers get access to content really quickly, help marketers and sellers collaborate um, so sellers can actually write and give feedback on uh, marketing content. And then they can deliver that content in a customized portal that makes sense for their customer. So curating that content yeah. in a brand-centric way. So some of the companies that are in that category really excite me. Yeah. Sales engagement, incredibly exciting where you're really um, looking at how to map out a multi-channel engagement experience um, primarily, those tools are being used by inside sellers, but I think they'll expand um, ultimately to the field selling organization as well. And then I was at um, an event that uh, I think uh, one of our clients hosted, and I uh, came across some companies that are now looking at sales playbook automation. Hmm. It's an emergent category. It's not even really codified yet, but really starting to help um, guide sellers in their conversations. Um, in the right direction to have better outcomes for both the customer and the salesperson. So there's so much going on that leverages automation and AI. I could go on forever, but yeah. those are some of my favorites. Yeah, I think um, at a base level, as you look at AI, there's an opportunity to take some of the, um, the commoditized activities, like scheduling right. a meeting, off the plate of yes. the sales professional. That's exciting, but then, in addition to that, you've got these notions of next best actions. Yes. Where you're able yep. to see some of the behaviors, some of the interactions of the buyer and come up with recommendations. And ultimately then those are executed by a human that understands, can connect right. on a personal level. That, that's kind of the, the meeting of, of, of the worlds. I'm so excited by what AI is gonna do for the seller. And at Forrester, we're doing a lot of research and uh, writing that looks at the future of work. And I've got a report teed up that's going to be the future of selling. I think we're going to talk about yep. that later in the year. Yep. Um, and I'm really going to envision, along with experts like Justin and many others in the industry, what does the future look for salespeople? Look for salespeople. And we hear, like, you know, is AI coming for our jobs? Absolutely not. What the AI is going to do is take the minutia off of salespeople's plates. Salespeople spend you know, I see a lot of different uh, data points, anywhere from 40 to 60% of their time on low value activities. So that's gonna be taken off their plates. And with that increased time, there's more opportunity to build trust and, and empathy, like yeah. you described. And then, you know, in terms of the higher value activities, I think we've only seen the surface being scratched with what AI's possibilities are. Right. Um, there's a company in uh, Toronto that's doing some great work, and uh, they have a, a Chrome plug-in to their solution. They showed me they actually overlaid my LinkedIn uh, page, and once they saw my page, they could pull out all of the areas of my interest, five areas that we're interested mm. in, and then surfaced up content that I would like to read. Yeah. So. I was reading a fascinating report about the impact that AI will have on the workforce. I know many people are concerned about the displacement of jobs. Certainly the nature right. of the jobs we do will change, but they did an e interesting uh, exercise where they went back to the early 80s when VisiCalc and Excel hit the market. They looked at the number of accountants that were currently being employed and the kinds of jobs that they were doing. And not surprisingly, they discovered that 
most of the tasks those accountants were doing were made obsolete right. because of these new technologies. Yeah. However, the number of accountants has continued to grow, yeah. and actually it's accelerated beyond the, the growth of the economy. They are, they are doing new jobs that are adding additional layers of value because you have the automation underneath it that's taking the commodity work off of the plate right. of the folks. So I think you know, these types of uh, technologies are actually going to enhance job satisfaction. Certainly there's going to be changes. But. Yeah. So um, you mentioned as well that there needs to be a partnership between sales and marketing. Right. That's, that's certainly the case in so many aspects of what we do from a go-to-market perspective. With respect to sales enablement though, what does that partnership look like? Yeah, so that's that's a great question, um, and and I think we're still sorting it out. Um, my research shows that right now about forty percent of uh, sales enablement uh, reports into sales, about twenty percent, twenty four percent into marketing leaders, um, and the balance into CEO, president, or head of strategy. So I think we're still um, sorting it out, but you know I think there's so many different ways that um, marketing and sales can work together as it relates to enablement. As you mentioned earlier. Sales is going to execute on all the brilliant plans that marketing comes up with. But um, just to give you a couple of concrete examples, I think that um, you know, marketers tend to have pretty big budgets now for technology purchases, and heads of sales don't, um, typically. So I think helping to fund either partially or totally mm -hmm. some of the uh, purchases that the sales organization may be interested in is something that marketing can, and can certainly support. Another thing that I think marketing can do is um, really put some more structure around the evaluation of new types of tools and tool purchases um, by taking a leadership role in that process and ensuring that sales, you know, leadership, line management, and individual contributors are involved pre-sale um, and that there's a process for piloting and evaluating um, new tools and technologies or uh, new capabilities within incumbent vendors and putting some more systems and process around ensuring that once you get some of this stuff, it's going to be wildly successful. So I think where we see challenges is when marketing or sales goes off on its own mm -hmm. to procure stuff or to launch initiatives. And typically those don't work. Yeah. So if I am a leader and I'm trying to decide whether sales enablement should land on the marketing side or the sales side, understanding that either way the groups have to work together. Walk me through the pros and cons of parking them in either group. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a multi-million dollar question and I've been grappling with it you know, quite a bit myself and I was actually surprised with the data because I thought it would have been kind of a 50-50 split. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think the, the advantage on the sales side is that um, it's always great to have someone who's walked the walk, talked the talk, been in the shoes. Mm -hmm. Credibility is really key for that role, particularly at the line level. Um, but, in, you know, the challenge with having enablement report into a head of sales is, and I can say this because I've been one, is that, you know, you can have five C's in front of your name, but you are still focused on the number. And it's, you know midterm, immediate, and long-term, it's always about the number, and that never goes away for head of sales. Mm -hmm. And so with that kind of day-to-day -day pressure, I tend to think that ultimately a better place for enablement to sit is with marketing. Mm. You have a more strategic view of the business, and because of the focus around the buyer, marketing's responsible for the customer and the customer experience. And so to me, um, you know, that seems like a more sensible home. Yeah. Um, but we'll see. Yeah, we'll, we'll see, see how it plays, plays out. out. Yeah. We'll see how it plays out. I think um, not only in the realm of sales enablement, but in so many other facets of creating this customer experience, there's an opportunity for sales and marketing to rethink traditional roles. Yes. There's an opportunity for marketers to step into a sales arena and vice versa. Yeah. And I'll give you two examples that I'm really excited about and that we've been experimenting with at LinkedIn. First of all, on the, the uh, demand gen and even higher in the funnel on brand building and awareness, mm -hmm. the, the insight that we had is we've got a large sales organization, obviously connected to a lot of buyers because in many cases they've spent their careers cultivating these relationships. Yep. And as they move from one company to the next to the next, they bring those relationships with them. Yeah. And so we were looking at our target audiences and suddenly the insight dawned on us a lot of these people that we're trying to target are already connected to the buyers or to the yeah. sellers in our organization. 
what if we could use our sales organization as a channel, a marketing channel, mm -hmm. to build brand, to build awareness? Wow. And so what we started to do is equip the sales organization with higher level content mm -hmm. around awareness, um, landing impressions, yeah. um, not not the hard hitting messaging deeper in the funnel that they were used to. Right. Um, and they would push that out through social media, obviously LinkedIn, but other yeah. social media accounts. And what we found is that the engagement with that content, because yeah. it came from someone because they had a rapport a with, exactly. Yeah. So suddenly we're viewing sales as the new channel that we can use to build I brands. I love it. I love the idea. You know, I think that in in many cases, and this may be more so, as you said, at top of the funnel, so to speak. Um, salespeople are more micro marketers today mm -hmm. than um, sort of how they've operated in the past. You know, when you think about how I used to hire salespeople, you know, it would be, you know, can they open doors? Can they overcome objections? Can they drive, you know, a deal through a linear process? And now it's really about, you know, the rapport, the trust. Can they curate content? Um, can they provide a white glove service to amplify what the buyer's kind of doing on their own? Yeah. So I love that idea. I'll be interested to hear more about uh, yeah. how, how it plays out. Seeing some early traction with it, and we'll, we'll continue it's to focus fantastic. on that. Then on the other side, um, you think about uh, the sales organization and what they could learn from marketers. Yeah. A big part of the, the sales cycle is uh, cutting territories, prioritizing accounts. Right. In many cases, that's done through massive spreadsheets and yeah. lots of voodoo magic. <laughs> um, but if you think about marketing organizations, they have gotten segmentation, lookalike oh. modeling, propensity it's, models it's, it's down a to science. a science. Exactly. Right. It's it's what marketers do. Why aren't we taking all that information and feeding it into the way that we cut territories? So there's yeah. an opportunity for marketers to play a bigger role on that yeah. side of the house as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, and you know, who knows where, where all this is gonna go? I mean, ultimately you have a revenue generating organization and that's comprised yeah. of product marketing and sales mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and probably there's a day where you're not going to have sales operations and marketing operations there's a revenue operations um, because we're getting linked together the technologies are linked together the initiatives mm -hmm. are linked together and you know you guys are doing some really fantastic things in, in terms of uh, turning the tables on traditional roles and is it and is it really is the uh, the buyer experience? Um, not bifurcated between sales and marketing. Um, I, I, th I totally agree with you. It's going to become a more blended organization. I agree. In fact, we did an analysis of the title chief revenue officer on LinkedIn. Yeah. And we've seen a significant acceleration in growth of that title yeah. as companies are trying to blend the sales and the marketing discipline. It makes sense. Yeah. I also really like the point that you made around subtle changes oriented towards the customer, Aptio, and, yeah. and what they're doing. One of the, the changes we re recently made at LinkedIn, um, we have a meeting where we come together and we talk about our businesses. We're now calling that the customer value meeting. Oh, I like that. And it's a small change, yeah. but it's amazing how powerful that is because every time you see that on your calendar, every time you walk into the meeting and it opens up, that's the reminder. We're yeah. here to talk about customer value. Right. And it, it makes a difference. I love it. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Um, I definitely wanted to leave some time to folks that are dialing in to ask any questions that you might have. As I mentioned before, you can submit your questions via the webinar console. While you're doing that, let me, uh, let me just ask you one more question, sure. Mary, and that relates to the specific role that marketers play in evaluating um, enablement technologies and also in helping to define um, the process. What are kind of the do's and don'ts? The, the, the strengths, but also the landmines that marketers should be aware of. Yeah, I mean, I think um, technology rollouts and initiatives and programs fail by and large, not because of the technology, but because not enough time and attention is paid to the people and the process. So, you know, the biggest mistakes that I see is that, you know, marketing can go out and secure the Porsche of technologies across uh, uh, both marketing and sales. But if sales hasn't been involved in those discussions, involved in the evaluation, involved in helping marketing understand the use cases, um, chances are, you know, there's a higher d degree for failure. Mm -hmm. So the biggest thing I could say, and, and I just see this mistake over and over again, is not spending enough time um, with thoughtful preparation upfront mm. around change management, engagement of sales, ongoing education, um, things of that nature are um, 
tend to really lead to failures. Yeah, makes sense. All right, we've got a few questions coming in. Uh, so awesome. let me go ahead and, and just tick these off. First question is, uh, what's the best or the most effective way to test B2B marketing and sales tools before introducing them to the field? Wow, okay. So um, I think that kind of relates to what we've just been talking about. Um, you know, we work with a lot of our clients at Forrester and helping them through technology evaluation. So, you know, you really want to understand what are the objectives for the new technology that you might want to get. Um, maybe you want to create an RFP. I think what you want to also do is, is again, involve key stakeholders who are going to be end users mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. and before you make a decision. Um, the other thing that you want to focus on is, is making sure that you can create some sort of a small pilot before you commit to a very large program. Mm -hmm. And you can learn a lot about a technology partner or vendor based on how they respond to um, you asking them to do a pilot, uh, both from a capabilities and a cultural standpoint. It's not all about you know, functionality, it's also about a cultural match. Yeah. And so you want ways to identify and understand that. And I finally would say, you know, for, for the marketers out there, stack the deck with your pilots. <laughs> don't just pilot it randomly. Think ahead. You know, who, who is the sales manager or the region or the product line who's doing innovative things, who wants to be perceived as a leader within the company? Yep. And make sure you do the pilots with those types of groups. Um, and then once you go forward with the program, turn around and have them as advocates as you roll it out. That's powerful. Okay. Another question relates to organizations that may be a little bit smaller. Sure. Don't have a full-blown marketing organization. Sales is just coming into its own. Okay. Um, have you seen uh, strategies to bootstrap um, sales enablement or do it on fewer resources? Yeah, that's, that, that's a great question. Um, and so... You know, based on the nature and size and complexity of your organization, you, you know, you may have one sales enablement professional, you may have 20 or 400. Mm -hmm. So you need to scale it appropriately to your business. But one of the things that I think is really cool about the cloud and um, as a service based business models is that they're really the great equalizer. So, you know, regardless of whether you have 10 salespeople or, uh, you know, 2000, mm -hmm. you can go out and procure solutions that top tier uh, companies could only have in the past because of um, low barrier to entry in terms of the commercial side and the commercial commitment. So for example, um, SPM solutions, those are solutions that help with territory creation, compensation management, um, and business planning, right? hugely strategic, complex solutions. Well, there are companies that are out there that allow smaller companies to buy those solutions um, um, digitally with a credit card. So imagine that, you've got five salespeople, but you can use the same business planning sophistication that a larger company can use. And so I think you know, that's really fantastic. Yeah, yeah. All right, uh, we could not get through this session without mentioning CRM. Oh, okay. uh, top of mind. Probably going to get in trouble now. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the question is, if you, it, obviously everyone has some kind of a, most have some kind of a CRM yes. system. How does the adoption of CRM, usage of CRM relate to sales enablement? Wow. Yeah. So our sales, CRM, I mean, that's just the, the conversation that just won't die, CRM adoption. And I get pulled into so many conversations with our clients, really big, complex clients where they don't have CRM adoption. And they don't know if they should hold up and wait and focus on that or move forward. You know, the problem with CRM is that it was never developed for salespeople. It was really developed, you know, 20, 30 years ago off of spreadsheets to facilitate faster invoicing. And then after that stage, it became a great uh, tool to measure activity and behavior of salespeople for first-line sales managers. And then it became, you know, an awesome tool for forecasting. So my view is that CRM and I, I probably hopefully no one will get mad at me, but it was never designed to be used by salespeople. Mm. And so we can bang the drum, you know, we can shake the stick and the carrot as much as we want, and salespeople probably still aren't going to use it to the way we need them to do it. But the great thing is now with natural language processing and all these other companies that are coming up, um, if you have poor CRM adoption, you can actually leapfrog the seller and start to automate um, all the things that need to be captured in your CRM do that, move forward, and still move forward with all your other um, sales enablement uh, capabilities and initiatives. So don't right. get hung up on CRM. Right. Yeah, I think for so many companies, CRM 
is the central nervous system of it the sales organization. Today. Uh, but there are, as you're pointing out, challenges, limitations that we've been struggling with. I love the point you make about automation as a way to, to fill that gap yeah. and extend it in a way that's meaningful to the front line right. to give them the tools that they need. So there are tools out there that salespeople can use like a, you know, like, like a, a Alexa or a personal assistant. Um, and then it's great for marketing too because all the data that you couldn't get access to because salespeople don't want to do data entry and the business surely shouldn't be paying high paid people to do data entry can get circumvented by automation. And I think that's really you know where we're going. Yeah. All right. Um, interesting question here about um, Agile. Obviously started as a development mm. philosophy, yeah. but has evolved into a, a more general philosophy of design, how we design yeah. processes, systems. Yeah. Um, with respect to sales enablement, sales and marketing processes, are you seeing agile strategies that allow for quick adaptation? Yeah, absolutely. And um, you know, we're we're seeing agile and and you know, in, in all aspects of sales and the sales ecosystem. Naked Sales is a book that I think a lot of people have been mm -hmm. reading that sort of talks to that topic at least tangentially. So yeah, I mean, there's one uh, one company actually I can speak about it publicly. It's Baker Hughes. They're in my report. I interviewed. Um, they're head of global uh, sales enablement there. And um, Baker Hughes, they say, we, we app our way to a better work week. And so yeah. instead of focusing on massive, big milestones and big initiatives, they're looking at making incremental um, progress and improvement for sales and marketing's life. And so um, they're constantly moving forward with an agile process. And I think it's working out so well. Um, that now sales enablement's being asked to add value to other or areas of the organization, whether that's you know pricing optimi optimization or demand or other 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 areas. Makes sense. All right, we talked about CRM, therefore we have to talk about ABM. Of the course. other the other three letter acronym. May I phone a friend? I'd like to call Laura <laughs> Ramos. She's our, our resident expert at Forrester, but certainly I can talk to it as well. Um, ABM is is an area of investment for a lot of organizations. Yes. How does that relate to sales enablement? Yeah, so I mean, I think you know when you think about uh, sales enablement, it's you're really looking at uh, the competencies that I mentioned, and also looking at programs, and so different types of programs, whether it's sales social engagement or ABM or um, you know capturing more digital insights or data. Um, so ABM is a clear program that marketing drives and owns, um, but. Um, it really fits into the whole concept of really getting personalization at scale. And so, you know, salespeople, I think in the past, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but, you know, it's often this, the squeaky wheel, you know, ABM uh, target lists were defined by the salesperson who had the biggest quota or the, the squeakiest wheel. And, you know, they'd scribble down a list of accounts and say, Justin, you know, here are my ABM, the accounts that I want you guys to do special mm -hmm. events for, right? Well, now today, ABM is highly scientific. And so I think, you know, marketing's role is to really work with sales and educate them on what marketing can bring to the table for their customer base and bring them into those conversations. And I'd really like to see marketing and sales work together on deal teams. So yeah. I talked to one of our customers who actually now has created pods um, and they have a marketer, a salesperson, customer experience, and a sales engineer. And so with ABM, you might not want to do it with every account, but certainly with accounts that are going to have high growth, maybe that's something you could do. You know, we at LinkedIn are getting, getting away from the term ABM and, and using the term marketing and sales orchestration. Yeah, I, li I like that better, ABM is, is really only half the conversation. Yeah. And really, at the end of the day, it's marketing and sales working together, orchestrating an experience. I love the orchestration. That's, that's ideal for for the buyer. I agree. I agree. And I think you know, going back to your agile comment, you know, you have a methodology, you have approach, you have your tools that are going to help you um, define your accounts and move forward with your initiatives. And I think uh, the best organizations, sales and marketing, will get together on a regular basis mm -hmm. and iterate uh, on that process: what's working, what's not working, and um, the orchestration is key. So. One person wants to know if you have any data metrics that reflect the impact that a good sales enablement program can have on an organization. Well, fancy you should ask. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if that's uh, one of our Forrester folks that are listening in today. <laughs> Um, well, actually, I, I'm, I'm not sure everyone knows about my research agenda, but I'm actually today um, just beginning and wor working on a piece of report, a report 
that's going to really look at the, t the total economic impact of getting your sales enablement program right, from both the strategy to the initiatives to the tools and technologies. And so I'm working with our TEI consultants on my syndicated research, um, and we're having a survey uh, that's being built right now that I'll probably launch next week. So I'm trying to get to the heart of this. Great. If organizations can get this right, here's what I think the lift is going to be um, for your business. So probably in about um, 45 to 60 days, we'll hopefully have an answer. Excellent. And just if you're within a company, how would you think about analyzing the impact that yeah. sales enablement has? Yeah. So the way we go about doing it is really start, you know, look at companies that are really getting it right and start to think about you know, as a seller, how much time do you spend on these types of activities? How much time do you spend um, recreating content that's already been created or looking for content? Or how much time will you spend um, trying to find uh, an RFP or update an RFP? And then we start to put numbers um, around different types of activities that sellers or marketers would do. Um, and these consultants are, they're, they're quant jocks. They're, they're supporting, you know, sort of the, uh, the analysts on the front end will really come back with um, pretty ironclad models mm -hmm. that um, we can take to market and, and feel pretty secure on um, that if a company makes these types of investments, uh, this is going to be the cost savings and this is going to be the lift. Going back to your points before also about beta testing, yeah. um, it is interesting to create a control group, an experimental yeah, group, A/B testing, and, and look at the difference between those two and yeah, use that as evidence. Yeah, that's a great idea um, as well. All right. If folks want to get up to speed and smart on sales enablement, uh, or or more generally the science of sales, are there books that they can read um, that would be interesting? Yeah, I mean, I think there's you know there's a number of different books that are being published you know pretty regularly. Uh, Naked Sales is one that I think is pretty inter interesting and pretty exciting. Um, another book was written by a friend of mine called Deb Calvert. I can't remember the exact name, but you can find her on Amazon. She did thousands of interviews along with her um, co-authors to really look at, like, like you did at LinkedIn, what do buyers want from the mm -hmm. interactions and experiences mm -hmm. with sellers? Um, so, you know, those are a couple that I like and um, certainly many other well-known um, books as well. You know, the other thing uh, that has been really interesting for me uh, lately is Stay on top of the blogs, stay on top of the yeah. podcasts. It's a new way to digest information. It comes at you in smaller bite-sized chunks. Yeah. I find sometimes when I dive into a tome, um, lots of insights there, but kind of washes over me at, at one point. Yeah. But just having one snackable item per day really, really totally lands. I agree with you. Like, I have a lot of people coming up to me at Forrester or clients, others saying, hey, you should write a book. And you know, when we talk about it internally, they're like, is that really the best format to get the word out there? And people want... Um, more modern formats, they want snackable, digestible formats, they want infographics. And so, you know, we're doing a lot with podcasts. And you yeah. can learn so much, as you said, by, you know, following a collection uh, of people you think are really smart um, in areas that you care about. Great. Maybe we'll write a book, though. All right, Mary, I think, uh, I think we've got some, uh, definitely some more material here that we could get out <laughs> there. But unfortunately, we're out of time now. This is great. We, we've been really maniacally focused on the discipline of sales, the discipline of marketing. At the end of the day, that really comes down to the ability to target yes. the right individuals. Absolutely. And uh, I know that you are a practitioner of the trade. You're a commentator on the trade. We actually want to test your mettle to wow. make sure okay. that you, in fact, have what it takes. So uh, to close things off, I have brought along with me the Nerf Strato Bow. Wow. Okay. And we want to test your targeting capabilities. I'm going to be your human target. And we're going to see how well you can actually zero in and target. Let me uh, nice. let me show you what I mean. I'm going to need your glasses here, safety oh, first okay. on the LinkedIn set. You have a lot of uh, faith in my abilities. All right. So I'm going to come over here, and uh, I'm going to give you pretend that this is your your ideal prospect from a marketer or sales perspective. I'm quite nearsighted. You've given me a bit of a handicap. All right. Don't worry about it. And in the in the words of. Uh, Mocking Jay, may your aim be as true as your heart is true, or something like that. All right, okay. let it rip. Put you out of your misery. Darn it. All right. No. No. What's going on? All right, your mouth, you're you're misfiring. Yeah. It's the technology. Oh my gosh, it's the technology. <laughs> well, Mary, change management. <laughs> it's been a pleasure <laughs> to have you on the show. It's Thank you blast. so much. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, everyone.